So we've already delved into some of the things you might have missed in Puppy Playtime Chapter 2, as well as some of my own personal theories about what could be going on in this factory. But one of the things we haven't really discussed yet are the darker themes of Chapter 2. Chapter 2, in my opinion, was much darker than Chapter 1, and this is probably because we had a lot more content this time around. But regardless, Chapter 2 had some incredibly dark themes, some that required just a little bit of digging. So in today's video, I'm going to discuss five of the darker details in Puppy Playtime Chapter 2. As usual, I'm going to give you the facts, but also some of my own speculations, because after all, it's just way more fun that way. Number five, Mommy Kills. So throughout Chapter 2, Mommy Longlegs has a number of games in store for us. It's clear that she wants us to fail these games. As an ex-employee, she doesn't like us at all, probably resents us due to what happened to her and she definitely wants us to fail these games and meet our demise, something in itself which is already quite dark. But something that quite a lot of you have been talking about, and rightly so, is that after the first two games, Mommy Longlegs actually kills the toys that ran those games. When you first enter the game station, if you look up at the ceiling, you can see a number of dolls that have been webbed up here. I actually think I figured out why, but we'll come on to that in just a moment. But if you pay attention the first time you enter this area, you cannot see a Bunzo Bunny here at all. After we beat the Simon Says game, possibly due to a malfunction as the game does seem to be rigged against us, we manage to escape through this vent. One very interesting detail here is you can actually hear some sort of scuffle as you're escaping. Well it turns out that scuffle is actually Mommy Longlegs killing Bonzo. Once you get back to the game station area you can quite clearly see a Bonzo bunny on the ceiling here. This is a large Bunzo and it's obviously the Bunzo from this game. Now it seems like Mommy Longlegs was very angry at Bunzo for not completing his task. His task in this case, to be killing us. Now this is already dark enough. Mommy Longlegs was so angry at Bunzo that she killed him. This is also very strange considering Mommy Longlegs is supposed to be very protective of the toys. Seems like she's only protective when she wants to be. We also see this happen once again after the Wacka Wuggy minigame. Once we successfully complete that game and make our way back to the game station once more, we can once again see a number of Huggy Wuggies on the ceiling. Now these ones are smaller and they don't seem to be the ones from the game, but I do think this is a representation that Mommy Longlegs killed those Huggies too. But what you might find very interesting about this is that once you see these Huggies, Bunzo has gone. Now why I think this is actually very interesting and potentially very dark is that we know for a fact Mommy Longlegs is aware of Experiment 1006. After all, once we foil her plans at the end of the chapter, she does shout, What have you done? You make me part of you! You can't do this to me! Being a pretty obvious reference to 1006, who does indeed steal her head. I am so looking forward to seeing how 1006 uses Mommy Longlegs. After all, they do say, two heads are better than one. So why is Bunzo missing? Well, here's where my own speculation and theory comes into play. I believe there is a reason why Mommy Longlegs is webbing these dolls up to the ceiling like this, and I don't think it's to make them a trophy. I actually believe she is doing this knowing full well that Experiment 1006 will take them. If this is true, that means that not only is she killing them, but she is also condemning them to be part of 1006, something that she herself fears. We don't know what this means. Will she still have consciousness while part of 1006? She did seem to be very afraid of it, and it does seem to imply that she's going to be suffering in some way while she's a part of 1006. So that means that Bunzo Bunny and potentially these Huggies are also a part of Experiment 1006 because Mommy left them up there for this purpose. It's possible that she's doing this to keep 1006 happy. Perhaps she had a deal with him. Leave me alone and I will gather dolls for you. In fact, this might even be the reason why we see Mommy Longlegs going through the factory in the trailer grabbing dolls. Maybe she's been feeding 1006 to keep herself alive. After all, it doesn't seem like she's a massive fan of him. She does seem more scared of him. So I don't think the two are particularly working together. More like an alliance of convenience. One that 1006 took advantage of the moment he could. Either way, I find it very interesting that Mommy Longlegs is webbing these toys to the ceiling like this. At best, it's a sign of her anger, but at worst, it's a much darker plot. Number four, Marie Payne. 
So chapter two all but confirmed that the living dolls in this factory did used to be people. And the confirmation we have is the fact that Mommy Longlegs used to be a test subject known as Marie Payne. So again, on a surface level, that is already pretty creepy. But it gets even creepier than that when you consider the fact that the name Marie Payne is tied to a real life story. So this one was actually brought to me by you, the comments, and I actually went through and did a little bit of research on this one. Now I have to say, full disclaimer and warning, I'm not gonna go into too much depth on this story because, well, YouTube content ratings, I don't want my channel demonetized. So if you want to do a little bit of research and you are the appropriate age to do so, go and check it out for yourself. But the safe version of this story is that Marie Payne was an actual real life murder story. In 1983, a four-year-old girl named Marie Payne was abducted. Now this story was absolutely heartbreaking, but I bet you can guess where this story goes. Now it's very interesting that this exact same name appears in Poppy Playtime. It's entirely possible that this is just a complete coincidence, but I'm not entirely convinced that's the case. After all, Poppy Playtime has a heavy theme of children. Children being the target demographic of the toy factory, but also being the target demographic of the experiments. We know from chapter two that this orphan program, whether it was created this way or it became this way later, ended up being used as an excuse to get children for these experiments. Something which is also incredibly dark the more you think about it. But if we consider that the case of Marie Payne was also a very real life and very dark story involving a child, then the similarities become apparent. Is this actually a very sneaky hint? Think about it for a second. The orphan program is essentially a kidnapping program. It takes these orphans, takes them to an underground secret laboratory or testing center and subjects them to horrific experiments. The real life story was also a story of abduction. Could this be a hint that Playtime Co. originally began by taking children in more nefarious ways? Perhaps before the orphan program was created, we also saw a number of disappearances. This gets even creepier though, when you consider that Elliot Ludwig had a death in the family. We still don't know how that death occurred or who it was, but when you start to piece these things together, it starts to get very, very creepy. Either way, the parallel between the real life story of Marie Payne and the Marie Payne in Playtime Co, which became Mommy Longlegs, could just be a mere reference, an Easter egg, if you will. But it could also have many other hints that I'll probably discuss in a future video. Number three, the machines are alive. So something we discussed in chapter one is the idea that the make a friend machine was alive. The reason we talked about this was because the eyes follow you throughout the chapter. And in the chapter two trailer, we can also see the eyes looking at where you went. This led me to speculate that the make a friend machine could be just as alive as Hoggy or Mommy Longlegs or Poppy. After all, if it's possible to transfer a human into a doll, it's absolutely possible to transfer a human into a machine. Why they would do this, I'm not entirely sure. Perhaps it makes the machines more efficient. Perhaps it replaces the need for advanced computing that they probably didn't have in the 1960s. Or, just perhaps, maybe this was a punishment, a way to get rid of people that ask too many questions. But this theme is actually reinforced in chapter two. We have another machine that is very similar to the Make a Friend machine. This one is the molding machine, the one that you use to make your new grab pack hand. But while these eyes look very similar to the Make a Friend machine, these ones don't follow you around the room. Well, there is a simple explanation for that. This machine is dead. If you look right back at the beginning of the chapter, you can see this title screen. Mommy Longlegs has her arms or legs or both wrapped around this machine and seems to be squeezing it. Now, why would she be doing this? It seems very unnecessary. After all, it's just a machine. Well, if you take a look at the eyes again, I truly do believe that Mommy Longlegs killed this machine or rather killed the person who was inside this machine. After all, the machine still works. So it looks like they doesn't need the person controlling them but it seems like Mommy Longlegs didn't like this machine or this person for some reason. I believe that's because this person used to be a staff member. And in fact, I believe that these machines were staff members repurposed to be more efficient. After all, think about it. If you put a staff member in the machine like this, they never retire, they never take a day off and you don't have to pay them. It's most likely that Mommy killed this one because as we know, she doesn't like the staff members. We also have even more to this though. I have already speculated before that the train could also be alive as it also has these very similar eyes. Now, if you look very closely at the end of the chapter when the train crashes, we do see a large blood splatter. Now, this could be coming from us, but it also could be coming from the train. 
That would also mean that if this train is alive, this person is condemned to live out the rest of their days trapped inside a machine. Maybe this is why the train crashed. After 10 years of being alone in the factory while all these horrors went on, trapped in a machine, unable to do anything about it, perhaps the train just wanted a way out. Either way, I think it's pretty safe to say that these machines are just as likely as alive as all the dolls in this factory. Although if I had the choice, I wouldn't want to be one of these ones. Number two, the reanimation. So some new information that we got in chapter two is that these experiments actually started in a very different way. It doesn't seem like the original purpose was to transfer people into dolls. It actually seems like the original purpose was reanimation, bringing someone back from the dead. Now this makes absolute sense since Elliot Ludwig lost a family member. Either he was trying to bring back his own family member or he was trying to beat death, make it so that no other people ever felt the same loss and tragedy that he did. Either way, we have some concrete evidence that these experiments did not start on people. In fact, we see that these experiments began on rats. Using this reanimation gel and the poppies, they tried to bring this rat back to life and that didn't quite work but then they mention that they want to move on to larger animals. Now, yes, this is most likely implying that they want to move on to humans, but something that we might not have considered yet is that there could be a whole range of animals used in these experiments. And in fact, I believe we have some pretty strong evidence to suggest that's the case. And that comes in the form of PJ Pugapilla. Ah yes, PJ Pugapilla, the half pug, half caterpillar, half creepy, that's too many halves, but you get what I'm saying. This creature, doesn't seem to have the same sentience as Mommy Longlegs or Poppy. What's very, very interesting about that is that PJ Pugapilla really does act like a dog. When we first see him, he's looking at you just like a dog would. He's looking at you expectantly, waiting for you to play a game with him. Now, yes, it's possible that this was a child or an orphan who just really enjoys games, but it's equally as possible that PJ Pugapilla was originally a dog transferred into this creature. After all, we know dogs are very good at obeying commands and they can be taught to do tricks. For example, sit, stay, follow orphan children to scare them. But this also gets a little bit weird when we consider the fact that Huggy Wuggy himself sounds very interesting when he kills you. If you go back to chapter one, Huggy has this almost scream, which definitely sounds inhuman to me. Now, while I personally do believe that Huggy Wuggy was a person, it's entirely possible that Huggy wasn't. After all, the second set of teeth don't exactly look human to me, and the scream he does when he catches you also reinforces this idea. So while we know for a fact that orphans and rats were tested upon, it's entirely possible that there are a whole host of things in this factory that aren't quite human. Whether that makes them more scary or less scary, I'm not entirely sure. Number one, the crumbling factory. Now this is something you've probably noticed if you've played chapter two. This entire factory seems to be falling apart. Now, yes, of course, this factory has been abandoned for about 10 years, which explains why this factory is falling apart. But I actually believe that this factory started falling apart way before then. And in fact, I believe the factory falling apart is what allowed experiment 1006 to escape. After all, we have evidence that during one of the PJ Pugapilla experiments, something happened. Both these scientists were writing and both were interrupted by something. I believe they were interrupted by this cave-in. Now, if you actually take a look at this factory, this makes a lot of sense. The whole game station and underground area of this factory was built after the factory. It was built underneath the foundations of the main factory. And we have concrete evidence of this. Another company was hired to do this in secret. Now, completely coincidentally, I've been watching a lot of Better Call Saul lately, and in that show, they actually had something very similar, where somebody is hired to dig underground in secret. And apparently, this is actually a very, very difficult task, which actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. But why is this so creepy? Well, something that nobody seems to have considered yet is that this factory is still crumbling. It's still falling to bits. And what that means is eventually this factory is going to crumble so much that all of these toys inside are going to be released. In chapter one, we can see that the factory was essentially on lockdown. Even Huggy couldn't escape this door. And we know that there are some toys in this factory that would probably like to escape, looking at you 1006. But up until this point, they haven't seemed to be able to do so. And I do believe that's because this factory has just enough security in place to stop them from leaving. 
But if this factory is so structurally unsound, there is absolutely nothing to say that this whole area is going to collapse one day. And knowing that these dolls and these toys seem to be highly resilient, looking at Huggy who could still be alive, and looking at all of the toys that we've seen in this factory so far, well, it's entirely possible that if this factory does collapse, many of these experiments would survive. What makes this even creepier is we know that experiment 1006 pretty much killed everybody in this factory. We don't know if he had any help, but we do know that the entire staff in this area are no more. That would mean that if these experiments do manage to escape, then wherever this is set is going to have a very, very bad day. But not only that, this could predict exactly what our role is going to be in the factory and what we need to do with Poppy. I personally believe the only way for us to stop this is to destroy the entire factory ourselves, completely bury it with everybody underneath. Perhaps that is what Poppy realised in Chapter 2, and that could also explain her change in behaviour. So there we go, these are some of the darker things in Chapter 2, some of them are a little bit more creepy than others, I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, don't forget to give it a like, let me know down in the comments below what you thought of this list, and as always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.